Channel 2, New York. This is Channel 2 News with Robert Trout. Good evening. President Johnson held his news conference this afternoon, not televised, you know, and he said that not long ago, just the 7th of June, he got a private report from somebody unnamed who he said had been in contact with the rulers of communist North Vietnam, and the communist bosses has said again, they are not interested in any kind of peace negotiations. Tomorrow, the president revealed his cabinet is going to hold a meeting at which Secretary of State Dean Rusk will conduct a thorough review of United States foreign policy and the whole international situation, in fact. And the Secretary of State will report on what Mr. Johnson calls certain other hopes for peace that the government is evaluating and is considering. When the president was asked about today's word from London, where the ministers of the British Commonwealth are meeting, the report that the ministers intend to form a peace mission for Southeast Asia, President Johnson said the Commonwealth ministers will have the full cooperation of the United States. On another subject, the president revealed that Secretary of the Army Stephen Ailes is to resign at the end of this month and will be succeeded by Army Undersecretary Stanley Reeser. Earlier, the president gave the Space Agency medal to the two astronauts, James McDivitt and Edward White, at a ceremony in the White House Rose Garden. And the United States says that the Dominican rebels used tear gas shells in the fight against United States and Brazilian troops of the OAS in Santo Domingo the night before last. Here in New York, the New York Newspaper Guild's executive vice president, Thomas Murphy, and four other Guild officials today met Herald Tribune president, Walter Thayer, to discuss the reports of merger talks between the Tribune, the journal American, and the World Telegram and Sun. Afterward, Mr. Murphy discussed the meeting with Dick Lobo and other reporters. He flatly denied that there were any plans of any kind, merger, consolidation of operations, any other plans in the works at the moment. But... I believe they are still discussing them, and I believe they are still working towards some solution to their joint problems uh, for uh, modernizing their production. Are you saying that the, that the key phrase was at this moment? Oh, I wouldn't hesitate to say that the only guarantee we could take is as, as of this moment. Do you believe and, uh, their only believe alternative is a merger, sir? Well, I think we must consider a merger as the most possible solution to their problem in the absence of any other known solution at this time. Did Mr. Thayer tell you that uh, there was a great need for something to happen? He told us it was absolutely essential that something be done in order to guarantee the continued operation of the Herald Tribune as well as he believes other publishers face Is there any significance to the fact that you came to see the Herald Tribune management first before you saw the other two papers mentioned? Only for one reason, that he invited me first to see him. It was also learned that the Department of Justice is making an informal investigation of the newspaper merger talks, looking, of course, into possible violations of the Clay Antitrust Act. A new move in the practically endless struggle to overcome New York's crippling transportation problems. The details in a minute. For the passengers of the bankrupt railroad, some good news tonight. An exclusive report on their future from that well-known fellow commuter, Tom Don. Tom? Well, Bob, the New Haven Railroad, which only a few months ago was trying to close down all commuter operations, may not be a losing proposition after all. We can report tonight that the conclusions of an engineering and financial study will be forwarded to Governor Rockefeller tomorrow, which show, reportedly, that with certain operational changes, the New Haven's main commuter service to Westchester and Fairfield counties can be operated at a profit. Sources close to the governor told me today that this report could become the basis for the acquisition of part of the New Haven's commuter service by the newly created Metropolitan Transit Commuter Authority. This is the new state agency which has reportedly agreed to purchase the Long Island Railroad for some $65 million. The New Haven has been in financial trouble for several years, particularly since the construction of the New England Thruway relieved the road of much of its profitable freight business. The heretofore unprofitable passenger service carries some 25,000 commuters to the city each weekday. On February 18th, the New Haven asked the Interstate Commerce Commission to permit gradual abandonment of all passenger service, but then said it would withdraw the request when the states of New York and Connecticut promised some financial help. According to this study, which is due to be released on Monday, the New Haven commuter service with modernized equipment and adequate maintenance facilities may be turned from an annual losing proposition of some $14 million to a profitable one of approximately $1.5 million. These changes, we understand, do not include any substantial reduction in the railroad's workforce. 
So it seems to be good news for the employees as well as us commuters. Bob? Calm down with good news, and good news is always welcome news. In its latest move to conserve water, New York City today banned all watering of lawns, gardens, tennis courts, too. Watering had been allowed on Saturdays, but that meant a sudden use of 200 million gallons every Saturday, dangerously reducing the water pressure in some places. Another point, there'll be no more warnings for water waste starting Monday. Summonses will be issued. One oasis in all this dry talk, swimming pools in the public schools will remain filled. The earlier announcement that the school pools would be closed drew angry outcries from school and recreation officials. And later, both sides said there'd been a misunderstanding, and apparently the 20,000 city youngsters who use pools like these will be able to keep right on using them when the weather gets warm enough to make a dip worthwhile. The city's reservoirs are down today to 53.8% of capacity against a normal 93.2% for this date. The court news. Three New York Negroes and a Canadian woman, the four who were convicted of the plot to blow up the Statue of Liberty and some other American landmarks, today received conditional prison terms. The three men got 10-year sentences each, and blonde Michelle Duclos received a five-year term. All of them ordered return to the court within three months with a report from the prison board that could lower their sentences. You remember the arrest of Miss Duclos, who had pleaded guilty and become a prosecution witness, and of the three men, Walter Augustus Bowe, Robert Steele Collier, and Khalil Syed, was brought, about, was brought about by a police undercover man who had infiltrated the gang. On Staten Island, a growing controversy over a house on a hill, a film report right after this message. A home for victims of drug addiction has become the center of an emotional dispute. And Jean Parr is back from the long voyage to Staten Island with the story. Jean? Well, Bob, it's supposed to be, it was supposed to be last night anyway, a sponsor meeting. But some say it turned into a jeering, rock-throwing demonstration. The scene, a place called Daytop Village, one of two havens for drug addicts in the Princess Bay section of Staten Island. This peaceful scene of Daytop Village that I looked at today made it difficult to believe that almost a thousand persons were angrily milling about the grounds last night. Today, while the drug addicts were in a seminar, director of Daytop, David Deitch, told us about the meeting. There were milling crowds, uh, stone throwing, rock hurling, tempting to, you know, tilt automobiles. Uh, the language uh, was the language of uh, gutter, brawl room, bar room caliber. Uh, ministers, people from all walks of life were attempting to get through. They would stop their car. They would hurl rocks at it, intimidate them by placing stickers on the car. They attempted to tilt a few of the cars. Uh, finally, more and more police had to be brought out to stop this mob, this mad mob, which had gone almost literally mad. Uh, I've termed it uh, Shades of Selma. In fact, one of the ministers last night said it was just like Selma. A few yards away from Daytop, angry residents have signs up to protest the project. A major complaint being the open door policy, the fact that addicts can come and go, that many served in prison, and that real estate values will go down. We spoke with one resident who refused to be identified about last night's meeting. Was there violence there last night by the community and the citizens of this community? I would say that uh, with the uh, great amount of people there, and there must have been at least 700 to 1,000 people from Staten Island, the, uh, the uh, protest demonstration, I think, was uh, in extremely uh, good order. There were many police there, and uh, they, they kept everyone uh, moving, and uh, they voiced their opinions, but their manner, I think, was good. Rock throwing was reported. Do you know anything about that? There are very loose rocks on the street down there, and uh, with the cars going by, they were thrown up by the tires, and I can't see how anyone could say that rocks were hurled. They were pu pulled up by the tires, but they were never thrown. A difference of opinion. This Saturday night, there will be another meeting. Some say that it will be orderly. Others on the island today told me they were clearly worried. And now, this is the last time I will have the privilege, and it indeed has been a privilege, to say, and now back to Bob Trout. You make me feel sad, Jean. You always make us all feel very happy. Jean Parr will be in a better mood tomorrow with another good story. 
There was another of those cheerful reunions today in Queens as a Roman Catholic priest from Belgium was reunited with four New Yorkers whom he'd hid from the Nazis for three years during World War II. At the time, the four young Jewish children were entrusted to the Reverend Hubert Silas by their parents, who were later seized by the Nazis and were murdered. With the priest standing by, Dick Lobo spoke to one of the children, now Mrs. Regina Wolbrum. Did he do this at the risk of losing his own life? Oh, yes, he was arrested twice. Once when my parents were arrested, they accused him of knowing where the children were, and he said he did, but he wouldn't tell. And then when I was arrested, they took him again, and God was with us. He got free. Did Father Silas ever explain to you why a Belgian Catholic priest would take in four wanted Jewish children? Well, he always said that it was uh, all people are God children, and it made no difference what race or what uh, religion. And he, he has done it for anybody, not only for Jews. He, he had many people that he saved. <coughs> the Reverend Mr. Silas, who is now a police chaplain in Brussels, came here to New York for the bar mitzvah of Mrs. Walbrum's son. The others he saved are Sigmund Rothenberg and their sister, Mrs. Sonia Kaner, all of whom live in New York now. In New Jersey, the Mercer County Medical Examiner today said that the state Democratic chairman, Thorne Lord, had strangled himself to death with an electric shaver cord. Mr. Lord, you know, was found dead yesterday in the home of County Court Judge Clifton Bennett, whom he'd been visiting. The examiner, Dr. C. Walter Carroll, said Mr. Lord, who was found sitting in an overstuffed chair, had managed to tighten the cord around his neck until he died. Thorne Lord had been separated from his wife. Apparently, he was in despair over marital problems, and that was given as the reason for his suicide, after he'd so recently been elected to another four-year term as the state Democratic chairman in New Jersey. The Parents and Taxpayers Association is mapping plans for massive political pressure against its opponents. That story in a moment. Albany legislators who voted against bringing, or who didn't vote at all, against, or didn't vote at all to bring the DiCarlo bill out of the Rules Committee, have raised the anger of the Parents and Taxpayers Council. The DiCarlo bill, you know, would have prevented the New York City Board of Education from busing children out of their neighborhoods for school integration. Today, the new president of PAT, Alfred Polizotto, said his organization will put on a vigorous campaign during the primaries and the November election against those legislators and also against Assembly Speaker Anthony Travia. Mr. Polizotto told Tom Dunn about the plans that PAT has for its campaign. Well, we have voted upon, with our membership, to go into each and every district of every assemblyman who either voted against our bill or refused to vote by walking out of the assembly by sound trucks, pamphlets, and door-to-door -door bell ringing if necessary to inform, inform the voters of each of these districts how their assemblymen voted or how they stood up on this bill. Why do you feel that uh, Speaker Travia double-crossed you? Well, Mr. Travia gave a personal commitment to our organization to have this bill brought out of committee. He not only refused when the time to bring out the bill was ready, but he also did all in his power to have this bill defeated. He will be the prime individual uh, in our campaign. Next, the sports news, brought to us by the only and one, or should that be the one and only, Frank Gifford. Introduced tonight by this news picture of a young lady at Iowa State College who's enrolled for a summer course in, of all things, football, to learn more, she says. Frank, you never fully explained to us the attractions of the game. Bob, we didn't have that. She looks like a number... <laughs> I must say, she looks like a number one draft pick, though. Well, everything that was said or written about the course for this year's U.S. Open, the Long Bell Reeve Country Club course in St. Louis, came true today as pros and amateurs alike fire scores that look more like the national death than golf scores. With players still on the course, Australia's Cal Nagel, Mason Rudolph, and amateur Dean Beeman were the only players in the 150-man field who broke par. Nagel looks like the first-round leader with the two-under par, 68. The former British Open champion who's never won a tournament in this country leads Rudolph and Beeman in with 69s by one shot. 
At even par 70 are South Africa's Gary Player, Rex Baxter, Al Guyberger, and J Lou Graham. The pre-tourney favorite, Jack Nicklaus, ran into trouble early. He double bogeyed the first hole and turned the first nine in a three over par 38 and is now five over par after 12 holes. Arnold Palmer, another top pick, had nothing but trouble with both his putting and driving as he finished the day with a six over par 76. In baseball, there were two day games scheduled with both taking place in the American League. The league leading Minnesota Twins stretched their lead to a game and a half as they downed the second place Chicago White Sox three to one. In the only other game, Detroit beat Boston six to five. Locally, the Yankees are in action tonight at the stadium against Baltimore, and the Mets took the day off for travel to San Francisco. The Yankees also announced today they've signed their number one draft choice, William Burbach. He'll report to Johnson City in the Appalachian League next week. Well, here in New York today, a spokesman for the National Football League said a meeting has been called for Monday to discuss the league's expansion plans for Atlanta. Expected to be present at that meeting are officials from several Atlanta groups seeking a franchise, a committee of club owners, and NFL commissioner Pete Rozelle. Present NFL plans call for expansion in 1967, but they more than likely will be revised in 1966 to compete with the AFL for a lease on Atlanta's new $18 million stadium. The AFL has already granted a franchise to that city, and Atlanta officials have indicated they want pro football next year. Well, only five horses have been nominated for tonight's running of the Rich Realization Trot at Roosevelt Raceway. The mile in the 16th race has a gross value of just over $100,000, with $50,000 earmarked for the winner. Castleton Farms Dartmouth, with Ralph Baldwin driving, will probably go off as a favorite, but the other four entries are also conceded, a good chance of taking the top money. Well, now comes the tough part. As most of you know by now, this is uh, Bob's last broadcast. Over the past 12 years, I've had the privilege of playing football with a lot of great players, and it always seemed to work out that the great ones on the field were even greater off the field. And Bob, during the past three years, you've convinced me that characteristic isn't peculiar to football. Nothing I can say. Frank Gifford with the sports news, and with something more, too. Well, the stock exchange added a little more to its recovery record as prices advanced along a broad front today with the trading moderately active. The closing Dow Jones averages showed industrials up 4.99, rails up 0.43, utilities up 0.33. Standard & Poor's 500 stock index was up 0.54 on a volume of 5,220,000 shares. More news developments on the way. The report immediately after this message. Not much in the way of beach weather today, but the weather was just right for building a city, a miniature Dodge City to be exact, being installed with volunteer help on the city playground at 76th Street and Riverside Drive. An experiment in making playgrounds more attractive, designed, constructed, and for the most part installed by volunteers of the nonprofit Park Association of New York. The Wild West cut down to what we could call top size. And they'd better get the roofs on quickly. The official forecast for New York and vicinity says tonight will be mostly cloudy and cool, with occasional showers lasting into the morning, the low in the 50s. Tomorrow, mostly cloudy, most of the day becoming fair and cool at night. The high tomorrow in the 60s. But Saturday, the weatherman says it should be warmer. Now in midtown Manhattan, the temperature is 66 degrees, the humidity 45 percent, the barometer 30.10 and falling, and the wind out of the southwest at 7 miles an hour. And the air pollution index has been brought down sharply by the breezes, standing today well below the official norm of 12 at 6.2. An effort to put a Puerto Rican on the New York City Council was announced today by the man who hopes to fill the job himself, Gilberto Herrera Valentin, the president of the National Association for Puerto Rican Civil Rights, declared his candidacy for Manhattan Councilman at Large, the post that's now held by Paul O'Dwyer, who you know wants the Democratic nomination for mayor. Mr. Herrera Valentin said he knows he faces a tough battle because he has no political organization behind him. So Dick Lobo asked him about that. Do you enjoy the support of any prominent Democrats here in New York City? Well, I have very dear friends in the Democratic Party. I think Mayor Wagner is a friend. I, he knows me, and I worked uh, for his election. In Will he endorse your candidacy? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, he's not endorsing anybody nowadays, so I don't know whether he'll endorse me. Will but you I, seek his support? I will try to seek his support, and I think that uh, he has shown 
uh, willingness to uh, have Puerto Rican representation, I think that he will be the first one to say yes. It's time that we have a councilman representing at least uh, 700,000 Puerto Ricans. Next, the entertainment news by Lee Jordan, here with word on a new film dedicated to the fearless men who whiz through the air at fantastic speeds. Tell us about the mad modern pace, Lee. Yes, sir, those magnificent men and their flying machines. Bob is a title. It offers some hilarious summer entertainment with some marvelously funny performances and sequences. It's a spoof on the early days of aviation and an air race from Britain over the Channel to Paris back in 1910. The subtitle is How I Flew from London to Paris in 25 Hours and 11 Minutes. And since that's about the speed our Europe-bound Bob Trout approves, perhaps this movie offers some suggestions on transportation for the Trouts. Now, this model should have wings enough for Bob and all those old souvenirs. Uh-uh, too much weight. Alberto Sordi has an aircraft with a different type wing arrangement. I think it's called Fly It Yourself. And this offers quite a contrast to Bob's exercise, walking. Gert Frobe falls back on marching, though, to get his German team ready for the race. And Jean-Pierre Cassell's a daredevil Frenchman determined to upset the Germans, even way back then. And he really upsets Terry Thomas, who finds he can't fly without wings, certainly not backwards. Frobe finds he must fly for Germany himself at the last minute. And here he is over the channel, trying to recover that elusive direction book. First thing it says was, sit down, which he did successfully. But from then on, as you can see, <laughs> the going got rougher. <laughs> and there are laughs all the way through and a pleasant rivalry, too, between Stuart Whitman as the American in the air race and, and James Fox as an Englishman for the hand of Sarah Miles. You'll get lots of laughs from those magnificent men with their flying machines. Tonight on Channel 2, it's The Monsters at 7.30, Perry Mason at 8, Rosemary Clooney and Sammy Davis, a play password at 9, Cliff Arquette and Pearl Bailey are guests on Celebrity Game at 9.30. The Defenders follow at 10, Doris Day and Howard Keel star on the late show at 11.20, Calamity Jane. Now back to Bob with good luck and my hopes you will come back soon and pick any kind of transportation you wish. I had been thinking of steamer, but now I think sail is faster. I mean, it's safer, not faster. Everything is going too fast. Lee Jordan, with the story of a wonderful film, it certainly looks like it. And speaking of modern transportation, the prospect of a taxicab strike is rolling toward us today, although it's not known how widespread that kind of strike might be if it gets here. The director of the Taxicab Drivers Organizing Committee, Christopher Plunkett, says delegates of already unionized taxicab drivers have authorized a strike at any time because of delays in getting widespread unionization. Mr. Plunkett said a strike might be against one or more fleet owners or against individual garages. Back in a minute with a final word, actually several words, after this message. Well, it can't be any secret by this time. You all must know that this is my last appearance on this daily news broadcast at this desk, but not, I trust, the last time I shall appear on the broadcast and on other broadcasts on Channel 2. I am off to Europe on a new assignment for CBS News, and although I'll be a few miles farther away, I expect to be working harder than ever doing television news stories for this broadcast series and for other CBS News broadcasts which are carried here in New York on this channel too. And doing some stories, I hope, in new and different ways to match the new and different ways of international transatlantic communication that are now coming into existence. It's at this point that I realize how attached I am to you who have watched and listened and how much I shall miss my friends, yours and mine, here in the news studio on this side of the cameras and the microphones. You know all of us whom you can see, and I hope that somehow, someday, you can see all the many, many more workers who labor loyally out of range of the camera lens. Tomorrow, this desk will be occupied by my friend and colleague, Jim Jensen, who will be here with the other members of the same happy family at 6.30. Bless you, and good night. This has been Channel 2 News with Robert Trout. Portions of this broadcast were pre-recorded.